All right, I know you already spent a lot of time on uh, word to back, but now that we have understood it in, in, in so much detail, uh, let's have a look at some alternative approaches to learn word embeddings that have also been proposed to remedy some of the issues that we still see in word to back or that one could criticize. And indeed, we, we have a couple of alternatives. Fast text, Gluvi, I also commented on, on Gen them. Nowadays, there are yet more. And it's fair to ask, what's the point of, of presenting alternatives? What's wrong with what to work, to work in the first place? What motivates the development of these alternatives? Or what are, what are starting points from which we can possibly improve upon word to work? And Indeed, there are some things that one could take as a starting point, and this is what uh, FastTag, for example, and also Gluvi have done. And I want to explain you briefly uh, what it is that they think is not ideal in Vertovec. And we will start with FastTag and then take a little more detailed look at Gluvi. All right. Now, FastTag. Um, the key difference between fast text and Vertovec is that Vertovec is proposed as an embedding of words. And you could also consider embedding not words, but word pieces or subwords. A subword is nothing but a piece of a word. So you are basically considering a more, more fine grained element in language, not the word anymore, but the subword. And the rationale could be that words do appear in different forms, in different contexts, where the form can change also with suffixes, such as singular and plural, dog and dogs, or cat and cats, or uh, consider boy and boyfriend, which is analog to girl and, and girlfriend. But there is no recognition of the internal structure of a word and from which component it is derived, such as girlfriend derived from girl and friend, Vertovec does not know that or it doesn't really account of that. And moving closer toward a character level embedding, where we essentially embed individual character and then represent a word by, for instance, the average of the character embeddings that the word is composed of, Fast text make a step in that direction. Although we don't necessarily go all the way down to the individual character and embed that, rather we consider a, 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 a bag of character engrams or, or subwords. And there is again a meta parameter that you can control uh, how long is the subsequence of the word that you try to embed. And I'm illustrating that here with the word matter. If we imagine we consider a window of three characters and we also take account of the start of the word matter and the end of the word matter that I am representing here with the with the brackets. So we have bracket MA as our first subword and then we have MAT as our second subword of length three and ATT and TTE, TER and ER bracket. These are the different, well, subwords we can derive from the word matter with this window of n equal to 3. And the motivation could be that by representing words of the subwords of, from which they are derived, we might do a better job in representing rare words. Because even if we haven't seen a rare word very often in a context, sorry, um, haven't seen a rare word very often in our corpus and because of that don't really know in which context this rare word might be used, maybe we are able to decompose this rare word into subwords, into its building blocks and can make sense out of these building blocks which we typically or which we might have seen a lot in our corpus. That is the idea. And then considering the word vector of a other word, a word V, 
context word v index c here, we could basically construct this word embedding just by summing over the subword embeddings, which I denote here on the lower right side of the slide with z, and then the um, the set of all the subwords that make up my target word I denote by uh, GW and then well essentially we're just taking all the subwords taking their embeddings adding these up to have our word embedding we see that's that's the whole idea uh, it's not so dramatically complicated I believe and then these these embeddings where do they come from how do we construct these ZGs well um, that is a good thing about fast text um, we do it in exactly the same way as we did in Vertivec. So we would use, for instance, Skipram and hierarchical softmax to construct these subwords embedding. So, so that doesn't change at all, which is, which is pretty good. We're just changing the, the scope or the, the subject of what we embed. And you see a bunch of papers here um, where, where the idea is elaborated, proposed and, and detailed. And I believe all of them, or at least the majority, I'm not exactly sure, but all of them, I guess, are also um, co-authored by Mikulov, who was the lead author of the famous word to vec paper. So, so later on, um, also after moving from Google to Facebook, Mikulov continued working on word embeddings, and they proposed then the idea to embed subwords or character engrams. And that's still quite uh, popular. So. You have the word embeddings, you have word embeddings that are used a lot, you have Gluby embeddings that are used a lot, but in many applications you also see people using subword embeddings to better ID address the issues with, with rare words. Or also with, with words um, that occur in the text that you are working with, but that have not shown up in the corpus from which a pre-trained embedding, say word embedding, was derived. So the, the, the key motivation here is rare words. And rare words are also at least part of the motivation for the other alternative, for Gluvi, which was um, introduced in, a, in an equally famous paper by Pennington et al. from the NLP group at the Stanford University. And Gluvi stands for Global Vector of Word Representation. Global is important here. And um, this global is, is, the term global comes from the idea that Gluvi wants to combine some of the strengths of previous embedding approaches, previous to word of vec, older stuff if you wish, put bluntly, but also word to vec. Um, as I said before, what, what's really nice in word to vec was this feature that the word vectors that it, it learns, they capture meaning. And you can show that they capture meaning by doing this arithmetic operations, where you subtract word vectors from another and produce something that has meaning. That's, that's very good about word to vec and that is also something that was unique at the time word to vec was introduced. Previous approaches did not, the word embeddings of previous approaches did not exhibit that behavior. And these previous approaches were predominantly geared or started from the word co-occurrence matrix where you basically count word co-occurrences at the corpus level how often do a word I and a word do occur together at the corpus I do probably very often or you do and these global count statistics these corpus level, corpus level count statistics Vertivec does not take, a, take account of these and um, that maybe leads that maybe leads to some inefficiency. Comparing Gluvi to Word to Vec in a in a nutshell, um, we look at the details soon. But in a nutshell, you remember how Word to Vec operates. You have a window and you stream over sentences, and streaming over sentences with your window, you you collect training data, and then you solve this prediction task to learn your embeddings, either predicting the, the context word from a single target work, skip RAM, or taking the context word, words and predict the single target work, word, 
what's that with me and word and work? I'm, I'm sorry. So obviously we're doing word embeddings, not work embeddings. And hence both Skipgram and Sibo try to construct word embeddings and um, well, Sibo to continue the thought. Sibo takes a bunch of context words in a certain window and then try to predict the single center word that you are that you're missing. But it's, it's entirely driven by this window that you basically move over your text sequences. There is no global analysis of the text whatsoever. And that is exactly what Gluvi is trying to address by constructing word vectors that also take account of, of global co-occurrence counts. A bit like LSA has done, but well, the disadvantage of LSA is that the resulting word vectors do not exhibit this nice behavior that king minus man is somewhat similar to queen minus women. And that is the motivation combining these two, two um, worlds, if you wish. And we will soon see how Gluvi achieves that by predicting the co-occurrence ratios of words. All right, that was the summary of Gluvi, and now we, we are taking a somewhat a more detailed perspective. So once again, these pictures are to remind you how Vertovec has some nice features in that you can demonstrate how the word vectors that it produces have picked up something meaningful. You have relationship between words that are associated with the gender female and the gender male. You can have these analogies like king is to queen as man is to women. You can also have tense analogy that walking is to walked as swimming is to swam, which also is a way to showcase that the dimensionality, these latent dimensions that you collect in these word vectors have picked up something meaningful. They have picked up something like gender. They have picked up something like, like tense. They have picked up some patterns that really exist in language. And same with this with country capital example, that's not related to gender, nor it is related to tense. And so it's unrelated from grammar, but it is related to semantical relationship in text, which is at least equally meaningful. Yes, and, and the word vectors from word to vec, they exhibit all these nice properties. And in summary, you can then say, you, they have picked up something meaningful from, from language and represent this meaning in the latent dimensions, which is great. Nonetheless, they do not, the word to vec, word vectors do not recognize global count statistics. And an example could be the word big data. If you have a sentence, big data is a prominent trend in industry, then we can speculate that the word big and data might occur very often together in our corpus. If our corpus is associated with, with, with news or technology or AI or whatever, um, since it's a, a known phrase, a common phrase, big data, we would expect it occurs often in the corpus. So this pair, big data, should also pop up quite often in our context windows that we shift over our text. If it's, if it's an, a common phrase, the two words will often co-occur. Yet, word to vec, it would not really know whether this, this frequent co-occurrence is coming from the fact that big and data are strongly related terms, or whether the frequent occurrence is simply due to the fact that big is a popular word or that, that data is a popular word. If you have a word that occurs frequently, you have a frequent word, then it's quite natural to expect that this word will appear in many phrases because it in itself is frequent. And word to work, they say, cannot really take account of that. Whether a frequent phrase is frequent because it contains one frequent word, or whether a frequent phrase is frequent because the words are strongly related as big data. And this is the argument for global count statistics, which would inform your learning algorithms from the embeddings 
whether big is a frequent word in its own right and whether data is a frequent word in its own right. And then if you see the phrase big data somewhere in text and you know that, let's assume, neither big nor data is very frequent in its own right, but you still see them often occurring together, that's a strong indication that they are semantically related to another. That's the, the argument that is made to motivate Gluvi. And it's a fair point, but we, sh we should be honest here. Um, Vertovec was the, the first paper came out 2013, but that was not the last paper. And there were some adjustments, some tweaks. For example, uh, at the beginning they trained the word vectors using negative sampling, and later they came up with, with uh, hierarchical softmax, I believe, which nowadays is often seen as a better way to learn these word vectors. So that there have been advancements in Vertovec, and in one of these, these follow-up papers, um, Vertovec authors also um, demonstrate and recommend to use uh, phrase detection. I was coming that, commenting on that at the end of the previous session, that uh, you take account of um, word frequencies as an additional heuristic. For example, you drop very frequent word and um, more recent implementations of word to back also have a phrase detection mechanism. We, we commented on that, saying that uh, you add very frequent bigrams or trigrams. My example was the New York Times, for example. And um, you add these to your corpus and learn individual embeddings for that. Well, um, just to be, to be really sure, um, you might remember this, this slide. It was 34 in my, in my slide book, where you have these word pairs and phrases point. Uh, this was later added to Vertovec as an additional tweak and advancement to learn embeddings for common phrases. And well, if, if you include that feature into Vertovec, then you can say um, this, this critic that you don't take account of global count statistic is somewhat mitigated. But still. Um, another issue concerns rare words. I have this exemplary sentence here. We find surprisingly many age lasts among university professors. And you might remember me uh, using the word age last uh, quite a bit before whenever I was, was looking for an example of a rare word. And I don't know whether you have heard that word any time before. If you're a native speaker, you probably have. If you're not, you might not have heard it before. I didn't know it before reading up on Gluvi, to be really honest. Uh, so just uh, that you can take something useful from this lecture. Um, the word age last refers to a person that does not tend to laugh very often. Um, and now you can ask yourself why I'm coming up with this exemplary sentence. Okay, so um, anyway, we have a rare word, like that one here. We have this rare word, and rare words uh, can trouble Vertivec, um, which has to do with the fact how we construct our loss. And that, bear that in mind, the loss, that proves important. Uh, the key distinction between Vertivec and Gluvi in the end is the loss function used for training. Spoiler alert. So loss is something important. And what's wrong with the loss in Vertovec? We have cross-entropy. What's wrong with cross-entropy? That's very commonly used loss function. It is. It's great. It's the choice for a um, multi-class problem. But for learning that vectors, if we have rare words and we have loads of these, then we are essentially trying to teach our neural network predicting these, these probability distribution over words and if there are many rare words, we would expect that the, the conditional probability that we, are, that we are trying to capture here are very inaccurate because the, the words are rare by itself. So predicting the probability of a rare word, we can't be very good at that task. The word is rare. We don't have much evidence to know with which other word this rare word will co-occur, like age last. What's the context in which we typically see the word age last being used? Question mark. That's a hard question for word because it's a rare word. But keeping all these rare words in our vocabulary, they, they show up in the output layer of the neural network. They get some probability. And then 
by softmax. And then training on cross entropy, these, these probabilities for all the rare, rare words, depending how many rare words we have, they might have quite a big impact on our loss. Or unless we impose some weighting, I mean, every word in our vocabulary has sort of the same impact on the loss that we have. In practice, that's not quite true because implicitly um, the rarity of a word will be reflected in the training data when we move our windows. But, well, I shouldn't try to dilute the point. The point really is the rare words, their probability is hard to predict. Cross entropy loss function tries to, to get this probability right, which is very hard, pretty much impossible. So they have this big impact on our training due to impacting the measure of loss, which we might not want, as the words are rare. So um, that's sort of the starting point for Gluvi, that we identify this these, these issue with rare words, but um, also with frequent phrases. And the argument continues to say, you know, the rarity of the word, as well as the frequency of a phrase, that can very nicely be be um, incorporated into the training, provided we make use of global count statistics of word co-occurrences. They will reflect both, both rarity and they will also reflect common phrases that co-occur very often together at the global level. And here you can see this, this dual objective of Gluvi. On the one hand, we want to not throw overboard everything that was done in previous approaches, count-based embeddings like, like LSA, uh, but we would like to retain the nice features of Vertovec with its prediction-based approach toward learning word vector. What are these pros and cons? Well, count-based techniques that start from the co-occurrence matrix, matrix they typically use matrix factorization algorithms. They're pretty fast, um, pretty scalable, although maybe not as scalable as the prediction window-based method of Vertovec, which scales very well with corpus size. In fact, the corpus size does not really matter that much because would, you have this window that you consider. And this, this window that you are considering of, of a target word and its context impacts the scalability of the algorithm. Count-based approaches use counts uh, efficiently. They, they are not that good at capturing word similarity because they only look at the counts. Similarity as in this famous, famous examples that king is two women somewhat as queen is to man. That is the type of similarity which count-based embedding approaches did not manage to capt capture so well. And uh, they exhibit some tendency to be biased toward very frequent words. Vertovec captures these similarities very nicely. The only critic could be that the use of count statistics is somewhat inefficient. And this is something we try to remedy, remedy with Gluvi. So we want word vectors that capture the meaning of words in a vector space and facilitate all these nice arithmetics. At the same time, we want to take advantage of global count statistics to um, improve upon only considering local information. Well, locality means that you have this context window from which you generate your training data and all you consider is this context window. But you um, note here that as we will see, the two approaches are not so fundamentally different in, in the end uh, when it comes to taking into account global information and local information. And maybe the next slide is enough to, to grasp that. I would like, uh, before diving deeper into Gluvi, reintroduce the word co-occurrence matrix. I have a bunch of example sentences here. I like deep learning, I like NLP, I enjoy flying. Not these days, obviously. And um, then we can construct, if we, we imagine this to be our mini corpus, uh, the, the co-occurrence matrix, where we have all these words and just count how often they co-occur. And if we make this count, the question arises, um, 
well, what does, does co-occurrence mean? Co-occurrence also implies some, some window. It also implies some context, which you, which you check to determine whether words co-occur or not. In my example, I am considering a context window of one word, which is for simplicity, it could be bigger, and then the matrix encodes all these counts. For instance, we have the word I, and we see that I co-occurs with the word like twice, like, like, and this is the two. And uh, we have the word like that certainly occurs twice together with I, yet it also occurs with the word deep, which is this pair here, and it also occurs with, with NLP, which is this pair here. I have a zero in the row corresponding to like with the word learning. I like learning. Well, like and learning in my three example sentences, they do not co-occur at a distance of one word. And I limit my context window to one. That's, that's my decision to count co-occurrences in that way. Practically, I need to have some window that I consider. And this is just an example of a very tiny window. And hence, the intersection of like and learning shows us a zero in the co-occurrence matrix, in the word co-occurrence matrix. So um, what this tells us is that when we build this co-occurrence matrix, we also need some window. It's not that we consider the, the, the whole corpus. We do go through the whole corpus, but co-occurrence obviously also implies some window. And that also, in my opinion, shows that Okay, but if we count co-occurrences over the entire corpus using some window uh, and compare that to having this windows of n words, which we shift over all the, 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 the sentences in our corpus in Vertovec, um, isn't that kind of similar? And yeah, I, will, I believe it is, there is similarity. However, in Glue, we consider these, these co-occurrence matrix explicitly. And um, traditionally, like in, in LSA, we would take this matrix, which is going to be big, because we have many words in our vocabulary, and then we would factorize it. <coughs> Using matrix factorization, we would cook it down to have a smaller co-occurrence matrix, a more handy matrix, we could use singular value decomposition, for instance. We could use other approaches. And then um, here, this co-occurrence matrix, uh, maybe one thing to note, it's symmetric. If I and like co-occur, then like and I also co-occur. So it's a symmetric matrix. And therefore, um, it, it gives us sort of word vectors. If we, we seek a, a word vector of the word learning, for example, Say we want to have a word vector of the word learning. Well, um, here it is. That's not one hot. My example is tiny, so I have only two non-zero elements here in my word vector, but that's the word vector of learning. And yeah, because it's symmetric, then this it doesn't matter which one we take. It's the same vector that we find here. So we do have a vector representation of all the words by just looking at the co-occurrence matrix. And then to use that, we want to cook down, cook down this, this enormously big matrix. This is where we use factorization and LSA is, is an approach that does just that. Okay, um, and, and this is why we can consider count-based approaches that start from the co-occurrence matrix. Um, predecessors of, of word to back. But um, let's spend a little more time on these, these counts. What Gluvi is trying to do, it, it starts from the co-occurrence matrix, but then it doesn't really look at the co-occurrences, and rather it looks at ratios. 
it looks at ratios of co-occurrence probabilities, where we estimate probabilities by means of counts, counting through the corpus using some windows. So we, um, the, the probabilities, the co-occurrence probabilities, their estimates come from the word co-occurrence matrix. And the um, authors of the Gluey paper, they, they argue that these, these ratios, they captured some interesting meaning um, or, or components of meaning. And this is an example from their paper to showcase what these ratios are about. We have conditional probabilities of two words, ice and steam. We take ice and steam as central target words, if you wish, and then ask, provided that the word ice occurs, what's the probability to see another word x? Or likewise with steam. Say steam occurs in some text, what's the probability of a word x co-occurring with steam in some window that we decide upon? And then in the columns, we have some candidate values that we could plug in for x, solid, gas, water, and session. And now we can ask ourselves, um, let me use black here. Okay, we have a sentence and we saw the word ice occurring in that sentence. How likely is it that the word solid co-occurs with ice? And then you can say, well, okay, ice is, is solid. So um, it's, it's reasonable to assume that these words co-occur relatively often because they, they share a certain context and that both are solid. Of it. So here we would expect something that is that's maybe large because ice and solid relate to one another. Doesn't matter how large, just you know, as a tendency. And uh, on the contrary, ice and gas, if we see ice appearing in some text, maybe not so likely that this text also talks about gas because gas is not solid, it's, it's unlike ice, so here we would expect something small. And for, for water, well, ice is frozen water, so um, that's clearly a, a relationship. We would again expect a large, and for fashion, well, fashion, ice and fashion, uh, we would again expect a small probability to of these words co-occurring. Or if we have already seen the word ice, we would not predict that fashion has a high probability to co occur with ice. And then uh, for steam, well, slightly different. Steam and gas, we would say, oh, that is very likely. That has something to do with another, but steam obviously is not solid. So here we would expect something small. Steam and water, that makes that makes sense. It's boiled water, um, that steams, for instance. So here again, we would see large. And steam and fashion, once again, that does not make much sense. So the conditional probability should be small. That's the argument. And then, well, if you look at the ratio of these conditional probabilities, P of X given ice and P of X given steam for these candidate words, then the ratio in the in the first case, it's important column, column. So let me use a different color. Here we would have large over small, so that's large. Uh, the next case we would have small over large, so that's small. And in the remaining cases we would have large over large and small over small, so that's roughly one, and that also is roughly one. And that is the point that Pennington and Al are trying to make. Um, if we have two words like ice and steam, and they share a context, which in our example is, is water. They both relate to water. One is boiled water, the other is frozen water. But they, they also have different contexts in which they appear. In which they appear. Ice is also solid, whereas st steam is related to gas, then the ratios uh, would pick that up, this difference they pick up, 
whereas the similarity of both being related to water and both being unrelated to, to fashion, um, well, there we have this value of 1. So, so that is basically just to say, look, this, this ratio of co-occurrence probabilities, they, they capture some meaning. And they, they help us to understand how, how ice is related to solid and how steam is related to gas. Although both ice and steam are somewhat related to one another. And indeed, it turns out that if you, if you well, process large corpora, and uh, certainly Pennington and Al have, have done that, they used a big corpus of 6 billion words and were working out these conditional probabilities and they found exactly that behavior. So this is just the, the matrix we were drawing before with some, some actual numbers from processing this big corpus. And then they conclude the ratios cancel out noise from non-discriminating words. And indeed, here the words water and fashion, although one is related to both ice and steam, and the other is unrelated to both ice and steam. And in that case, neither of the two words, water or fashion, help us to discriminate between ice and steam. The words solid and gas, however, they help us to discriminate between ice and steam and to understand this, this difference between the two words. And so the argument is that it, it seems to make sense to focus on the ratio of co-occurrence probabilities, where the co-occurrence probabilities, they follow from these global count statistics. That's where the um, co-occurrence matrix kicks in. This is how we get these probabilities. And then these ratios, they seem to be important. So we, would, we, we, we should grant these ratios a role when we learn word vectors to represent ice and steam and also water and fashion in other words. That's the idea in a nutshell. Um, going one step further, so the ratio of co-occurrences we take as the starting point for training word vectors. And now we need some um, notation. In the previous example, we had three words. We had ice and steam, and we had one word to discriminate them, X, like solid or gas or water or fashion. So overall, in these ratios, we see three words. And the following, we will use three indices, I, J, and K, in order to refer to these words whereby i is considered to be a, the central target word that we typically have when we train word vectors. We have target words and we have context words. That doesn't change in Gluvi. And I will again use bold small letters to represent word vectors and I will use v as before to refer to the word vector of my, of my central word and I will use the symbol u uh, either with J or with K, to refer to the word vectors of the context words. Right, and then the probability Pij is the probability of word J occurring in the context of word I, considering some fixed window. What's the probability of context word J appearing in the context window of word i, which will go a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right, essentially. That is equivalent to Werdebeck. And we estimate this probability using our co-occurrence matrix that we can construct fairly efficiently when we build up the corpus. Building up the corpus, well, we need to process all the words in any case. And then storing these, well, getting these counts and storing them, it's, it's not for free. It costs us some computation, but it's, it's not a major challenge. It's, it's not a thing that would render the approach computationally feasible, right? So we, we get that reasonably cheap, let's say. And I have a, the co-occurrence matrix shown here on the right. And then 
it exemplifies how we can get the probability pij, which we interpret as the conditional probability of seeing word j in the context of word i, our central word, and we determine that in a count-based manner, the number of times that word j appears in the context of i over the total number of words that appeared in the context of i, which is the sum over one of these rows, right? I'm showing that for the word deep, could have picked any other. So here in this example that I have highlighted in green, deep would be i, deep would be my central word. And then, well, our, our new goal, our new learning goal is to predict not the next word or, well, not as in skipgram where we predict the, all the context words or in SIBO where we take the context words and predict the central word. That was our goal in Wörterweg, skipgram and SIBO. Now we introduce a novel goal, a novel learning goal, which is to predict these co-occurrence ratios. So pij over pik, where i is the central word, the embedding of which we are seeking. And we have two other words, j and k, by the empirical argument with these, with these counts and the count ratios. And we say, well, our learning goal is to find a function that receives as input the word vectors of the three words involved, uj, uk, our two context words, and of our central word vi. And this function, we wanted to output an estimate of these ratio of co-occurrence probabilities of i with j and i with k. That's the learning goal. Because we believe these ratios of co-occurrences to carry important meaning. And we don't know what f is. We just know it's some function that we are seeking. Uh, we know the right-hand side, which we can get from the corpus. As I said, it's not for free, but it's reasonably cheap to calculate these ratios. F is to output an estimate of the ratio of co-occurrence probabilities. And F is something we need to engineer. It's not given. And, well, the, the authors of the Gluey paper, that's one of their big accomplishments. They came up with a good way to have to design this word vector function f. Um, I'm just trying to sketch some of the, of the steps. We won't go through all the steps. That would take too long. Okay, so uh, once again, design a function of the word vectors that predict the co-occurrence ratio. That's copy-pasted from the previous slide. Keep in mind our notation for i, j, and k, central word, and the two context words, right-hand side extracted from the corpus. And well, that, that's a bit, th there is no right answer to the question, what is f? It's, it's not a, a puzzle where we, which we can solve and then we know exactly what f is. That's not the idea. Uh, the paper rather argues, that, let, let's try to design f. Let's try to make up some function that, that does a good job in, in estimating these co-current ratios while following some principles. And um, one of these principles, for instance, is that if I have a probability and I divide it by another probability, the result is guaranteed to be some number. So we, all the, the functions that we need to consider are those that output a scalar number. So a scalar function, as clearly has to be some scalar function. Okay. And well, I, as in Vertuvec, the ultimate goal, it's often forgotten or, or easy to get, get lost here, the ultimate goal is not to solve some prediction task. In Vertuvec, the ultimate goal is not to predict which context word, a central word, is triggering. That's not the goal. And neither in Gluby, the ultimate goal is not to predict these ratios. We have these ratios. We can just look at the count statistic. The ultimate goal really is to get good word vectors. And good word vectors, um, as said before, amongst other, um, they will allow these, these, these nice algebraic expression to show that they have picked up some meaning. 
we want operations and the vector space between word vectors that are clearly related to produce similar results as in word to vec. So if, if the meaning that we want our word vectors to express, if the meaning is somewhat expressed by simple arithmetic operations like adding or subtracting word vectors from another, then it could make sense, no, well, could is a bit too soft here, it does make sense to have f as some function that also um, performs some vector arithmetics. That's a bit fuzzy, I know, but um, it's really an engineering of this, this function, which the authors of the Gluvy paper uh, walk you through, or same with, with other sources. So taking these considerations into account, adding some more, which I'm skipping over, they come up with a choice of this function capital F that obviously depends on the word vectors and is to approximate the probability ratio and they have a ratio of um, E of the scalar product of the central word vector and the two context word vectors. And, and again, that there is nothing that tells you this is how the function needs to look like engineering work and maybe you could agree that there is some sense to this this form here in that we know that the scalar product of two vectors is a measure of their similarity we, we know that if you're a bit lost here just remember the cosine similarity measure which I was introducing earlier on the scalar product is just uh, an, an unnormalized uh, an unnormalized way of, of cosine similarity, if you wish. If the scalar product of the two is, is a large number, that can only be the case because our two vectors show similar values at similar positions. And this is why the scalar product is a measure of similarity. So we are taking the similarity of our central word i with context word j and the same with the other context word and then this ratio we we hope will give us an approximation of the co-occurrence probability that we get from the global count statistics and if our word vectors are such that this approximation works out then we have achieved our learning goal. We want to learn these count statistics because we believe in them and we believe they tell us something really important about the words. So, so why not constructing the word vectors in that way? So I'm not saying uh, that's the only way to do it. What I'm saying is it looks like this function f does make some sense. Okay, if, if, if that is the case we can perform some mathematical operation. Since we have the, the exponential function here, it will make sense to take logs. And uh, taking logs will also help us to get rid of the ratios. So taking logs. And we also introduce some bias terms here, uh, bj and bi. That's some sort of neural networking magic. If you wish, we introduce some bias terms. You can show that um, that helps also to take account of word frequency. Uh, not dramatically important. Um, then we have this reduced function, or we can basically transform um, our our choice of f to this function here. Uh, also exploiting that we can express the probabilities of co-occurrence with our count-based estimates that we have. Right, and then um, well, if if this is uh, if this is the new form of f after applying some transformation to the previous one, so if we go from here to here, and we you can convince yourself that this is possible, um, a more formal 
the variation obviously is in the Pennington paper. If you can go from here to here, then you have this this equation, and um, well, ultimately you want your word vectors to to approximate this um, xij, the number of of co-occurrences of j in the context of i. You want to approximate that as as good as possible. So essentially, what you do, you take this function that I have just highlighted, and you well apply some some loss function here. You minimize the loss or maximize the accuracy of the approximation. And since you want to minimize some loss, why not taking squared error? Right? So the, the, the lower equation here, where I also introduce the symbol j to signal, that's the loss function, is essentially the squared error loss of, of this guy here. Right? So that's just squared error. loss. Right? Again, I, I know that I, I did skip over some of the steps. Um, the, the whole deviation is a little bit tedious. The paper is not the easiest to read either. Um, anyways, I hope it was, you agree with me that, that some of the steps this makes sense. And by focusing or, or making the core current probabilities our new learning goal, we can construct this loss function which Pennington and R then, then further refine in that they introduce a weighting function and so they obtain their weight vectors in Gluvi from minimizing a weighted least square loss and the weighting here is this H of xij where we weight co-occurrences. On the one hand uh, we don't want infrequent words to be weighted too high because infrequent words as said H last, right? You remember? Um, well, they shouldn't influence the loss too much. That would introduce noise. At the same time, we don't want common phrases to dominate the loss, like it is or I am. Shouldn't put too much emphasis on that. So they, they introduce this weighting term. And then the minimization of that objective for the components of our word vectors, that's how Gluvi works. This is how Gluvi word vectors originate. And the graph I'm showing here is, it's again, that's something they empirically construct and propose in their paper, how the shape of this weight function should be like. That is purely based on empirical experimentation. So again, there is nothing that would enforce exactly this choice of H. It's just something that they found to work well and clearly they experimented a lot. So uh, it's an established choice, let's say. All right. Um, and I think in their paper they, you can also read something like, well, this, the, the threshold that they use. So we let the weight increase up to a certain threshold, frequency threshold, to not let frequent co-occurrences dominate the loss, um, where they pick a value of 100 and they say in their paper that uh, the performance of Gluvi is, is fairly robust to that. So the, that the parameters that they introduce here, this X marks and the alpha, um, they sort of say it's, it's not too much of an, of an issue. Just having uh, alpha equal to um, 3 over 4, they found to give a slightly better performance compared to a linear weight, where they would choose alpha equal to 1. But that's really, that's engineering work. Um, so uh, let's try to, to sum up what's core about Gluvi. We use global statistics to predict the probability of word J appearing in the context of word I. Predicting this co-occurrence probabilities is our goal, and we pursue this goal through a least square objective that we minimize during training. And th the origin uh, of Gluvi and of word to vec they, they look very different and sound different, but mathematically the two are extremely similar. And, well, just some, some more information on that. 
as I said in VirtualVec, we implicitly over uh, optimize over a co-occurrence co matrix implicitly uh, by streaming over word windows this perspective of our window which we stream over the text also give us a sense of, of co-occurrence probabilities and then we minimize a weighted sum over the cross entropy between the predicted and the actual word distribution in the context of the target word while the weights they, they come from the streaming from streaming the data um, and, and there are equal between words that appear in times Virtuvec also has some, some weighting implicitly which comes from the streaming uh, but the, the weighting could, could be an arbitrary function and this is exactly what it is in Groovy so the key difference really is the loss here where Virtuvec pursues this cross entropy objective over normalized probabilities while, while Groovy minimizes the log mean square error between predicted and observed unnormalized probabilities the log of these count ratios um, that, that's the key difference and then numerically um, the least square loss might have some advantages empirically the, the earlier evidence suggested that Gluvi is maybe a little better than Virtuvec later on more evidence came out that um, well when, when taken together does not give any clear signal whether one is better than the other um, letting me hide the fact that we, we haven't really talked about what actually makes up a good embedding right okay um, anyways um, before further reasoning about the quality of embeddings let's, let's try to summarize the chapter as a whole putting everything together which was the chapter on the word embeddings where uh, the whole point of this approach is to map words to numbers either words as the most famous approaches do or as we have seen with the example of fast text of subwords and we want to represent our words or subwords as low dimensional dense vectors that live in some space and where arithmetic operations that we can perform in the space of word vectors have meaning or represent meaning that exists in language that's the idea many frameworks exist that put that into working code and working solution one similarity among all the approaches is that they learn word vectors in an unsupervised manner and when I say unsupervised what I mean is that it's not us as analysts defining some sort of label which is to be predicted in a classical supervised learning framework especially Virtuvec and by extension FastX they have this well artificial prediction task so they perform some sort of supervised learning but the labels um, are not costly to obtain they come naturally by construction because we um, no, we, we, we shift a window over text and then collect labels by making one word the central target word and then predicting that word or the context word appearing nearby so it, it's not really unsupervised learning but we don't have we us here right we don't have to perform any costly labeling of text prior to learning word vectors that's that's very important because any approach where we would need proper labels uh, would not scale to large corpora it's impossible so we need a replacement uh, but still we need some some measure of, of loss that we can minimize and this is where at least Gluvi and Virtuvec really differ in how they come up with this with this measure Virtuvec and its cousins are they are used a lot in various downstream applications and then this this question I was commenting on earlier which one is best the easiest way really to answer that is through the lens of a given application that's also most relevant for practice because if you face a problem that you're trying to solve some NLP problem you want to model the sentiments in a bunch of tweets that talk about the the, the product you're you're selling for example 
then what really matters to you is the quality of your sentiment classifier. That is what, what interests you, right? And then uh, the quality of the word embedding is the function of your, how well it allows you to predict the sentiments or capture the sentiments in tweets. And there, um, well, there are so many papers that use uh, word vectors. I clearly haven't read all of them. That's pretty much impossible for a single human being, I believe. Um, what I'm trying to say is, what if you are concerned that you you have a task and you don't know should I pick a Gluvy or Vertebeck? What is the right embedding for my task? One way to look at it would be well, maybe there is if you have the resource, try it out and then measure the quality of the embedding um, by by means of how well does your downstream model performs. How well does the downstream model solve its task? That's a good way. In pure NLP, if, if later on you decide to become a, a hardcore NLP researcher or, or engineer, well, there are, there are measures such as the measure of perplexity to, to capture really the, the quality of, of embeddings. Perplexity could be com considered here as a performance measure of a word embedding. Or you could look at the performance of an embedding in these analogy tasks. Man is to king as uh, women is to queen. Or you can look at, at training time. That was also done in the Gluvy paper where they tried to make the argument that their training is a little faster compared to VEC which makes sense if you go for squared error as opposed to cross entropy. But I believe um, that's not the typical role for most of you. For us, we need these word embeddings because we, we face an NLP task that we want to solve, such as sentiment analysis, text classification, or whatever. And um, then the question of what works best is easiest answered through the lens of our application where standard measures like, like AUC, classification, accuracy, and the like um, can give you an answer to the what is the best question, what's most suitable. Well, uh, word vectors, no matter which one you like best, they are useful in many, if not any, NLP task. And what we typically do is we don't learn them from scratch if we face a downstream applications, we don't learn them from scratch, but we use pre-trained word vectors that are available on the web. The authors of Gluvy made available many pre-trained embeddings that you can download, and we will play with these, and use these. And in, in this regard, using word vectors, or at least pre-trained word vectors, in your application, in your downstream task, is actually a form of NLP transfer learning. And um, that's maybe sort of motivation to think more about NLP transfer learning. And guess what? That is what we will do in the next session. So uh, we're done with the word embeddings. If you want to read up, uh, you can find all the, the sources here in the end of the slides, where I would once more like to express my gratitude to all these great resources that I could draw upon to construct my slide book. In addition to our standard textbooks like Dive into Deep Learning and the language, Natural Language Processing with Deep Learning from Stanford, I put some, some blogs here that I like uh, or some, some YouTube lectures that you might want to have a look to further read on certain parts. And uh, certainly you have all the papers that I was referring to for a more formal perspective. And um, that is it for now. We're done with, an, uh, with the word embeddings and we have also accomplished and completed our second lecture on uh, text analytic, meaning that there is one more to go where we talk about this NLP transfer learning stuff, which I can assure you is very interesting and we are really getting very close to the state of the art. Thank you once more very much for your attention and uh, I hope to see you back very soon. Bye bye, until next time.